Good morning, everyone. I'm really excited to introduce today's speaker, Charles Coquel from the University of Edinburgh and actually founder of the UK Center for Astrobiology. And he received in the not too distant past his PhD from the University in Oxford. And he spent his postdoctoral years all around from NASA Ames to um, the uh, British Arctic Survey, if I'm, Antarctic Survey, and um, who? And, uh, in Stanford before he finally became a professor, I think in 2005 for geomicrobiology at the Open University. And since 2011, he is actually a professor for astrobiology at the University of Edinburgh. And he is really interested in life in extreme environments, assessing habitability of different planetary bodies in our solar system and biosignatures. And today he's going to talk about uh, about impact cratering as a biological process. Thank you so much, Charles. Thanks a lot, Connie. Um, and um, uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Unfortunately, my PhD was sort of ancient a long time ago. <laughs> is, the, is the horrible reality. But it's been a fantastic week here um, at UT, and I'm really grateful Connie for organizing the week. A lot of very productive, interesting discussions across geophysics, biology, and astronomy as well. So, so, so thank you for, for your welcome. I, I thought today I'd talk about something that um, I wouldn't say has been a continuous part of my research, but I've, I've worked on on and off over the last couple of decades, which is thinking about um, asteroid and comet impacts and their effects on substrates and thus the effects for for biology, for microbial life. And I think it's an interesting intersection between biology and, and geophysics, a, as will become apparent. I'm a microbiologist, I should say, biochemist. I've sort of a little bit of a learning curve, learning about geology and geophysics, which is important and sort of um, inescapable to start looking at effects of, of asteroid and comet impacts for habitats for life. So I'm going to um, describe some of these processes. You might think, why would anyone be interested in impact cratering? Um, it seems like rather an ephemeral, infrequent problem for the biosphere. But if you think about it for a moment, asteroid and comet impacts are one of the few processes that will deliver um, a potentially destructive pulse of energy into a biosphere that is universal. So if you think about wildfires, for example, wildfires introduce a pulse of potentially destructive energy into an ecosystem but they can only really happen on a planet where there's sufficient oxygen for things to burn uh, or combust. Um, if you think about, uh, for example, volcanism, volcanism is a little bit more of a universal process, I would say, than, than wildfires. But still, it's not universal, even on the surface of present-day Mars. There's, there's not active volcanism, at least on the surface. The planet is tectonically active, but there's no fusive volcanism on the surface of the planet. And yet we know of no solar system forming process that is completely clean and does not result in leftover remnants of material during the formation of a protoplanetary disk. So I don't think it would be a stretch to say that if there was any life out there in the universe, that intersection between impact events and biospheres uh, would be a universal process. And so it's of interest to try and understand what actually do impacts do to the geology of a planet and what are the subsequent effects on life. Now, you are probably aware of the fact that one major intersection between impact events and biology is their purported involvement in mass extinctions, the best characterized being the uh, end Cretaceous extinction 66 million years ago, uh, which led to the death of the non-avian dinosaurs and about three quarters of all animal and marine life on the earth. But if you have come here to listen to uh, a talk about dinosaurs and mass extinctions, I'm going to disappoint you right away. And so I'm actually not going to talk about that, although it's immensely important. In fact, there are other people like Chris who know a lot more about this and recovery uh, than I do. I'm going to focus on a slightly different aspect of the connection between impact events and biology. And I want to talk specifically about the way in which this pulse of energy, thermal energy and, and pressure delivered into the geological substrate of a planet changes the, the, um, the opportunities for microbial life, and specifically some of the benefits that might occur from this process. We tend to think of impact events as wholly destructive agents, which is not unreasonable if you think about these sorts of images that play in our minds. Uh, and yet what I want to show you is how impacts can improve the conditions for life, which is of interest for trying to understand how impacts might broadly affect habitability in other contexts. So we'll get to a little bit of astrobiology at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the talk. 
So let me um, begin with some research that I did um, 22 years ago now, 23 years ago, a long time ago when I was a postdoc. And that was when this interest, um, this sort of on and off interest in impact events in biology began. And I was doing some work up in the Horton impact crater, which is a 31 million year old crater up in the Canadian high Arctic, it's actually on Devon Island, which is um, it's a bit of trivia, it's the largest uninhabited island on the earth up in the Canadian high Arctic. This is an impact into a Nisic basement with, with a carbonate, um, carbonate target rocks as well. It's about 24 kilometers in, in diameter, it depends of course where you measure that from, but from rim to rim, 24 kilometers. And as I say, the, the basement rock here is, is nice. Now, just to put you in the picture, uh, I'm sure some of you are familiar with this, but for those of you who maybe haven't thought much about impacts before, just to summarize what happens here. If you imagine standing here uh, 31 million years or so ago when this impact event occurred, it was not Arctic desert then. It was probably more like um, forested pine, Miocene sort of um, uh, landscape. What you would have seen is an object come in, probably something on the order of a kilometer in diameter, it hits the ground in, in, a, in a phase called the contact phase, and then it excavates material from the surface of the earth called the excavation phase. And in that excavation phase, the enormous kinetic energies in that object are transferred into the ground to create a thermal pulse. And the rocks in the target area are heated up. I should say not all of the energy goes into uh, a thermal pulse. Some of that energy will be delivered as a pressure wave through the material. And then there will be a decompression when that pressure wave passes through the rocks and that will cause fracturing of the rock as the energy exceeds the fracture energy. So you're heating the rocks and you're intensely pressurizing them. Of course, that will decay um, according to some function depending on the rock type as you move away from the impact crater. And of course, the scale of that um, thermal pulse and pressure pulse will depend upon the size of the impactor, uh, which is of course linked to the size uh, of the crater. In the case of the Horton crater, um, that rock would have been expelled from the crater, but some of it would have been uh, crushed together, if you like, and mixed up into a conglomerate. It would have flown up into the sky and fallen back into the crater. So a proportion of that excavated material ends up back in the impact crater. In the case of Horton, you can see this breccia lens, this gray material inside the impact crater. And this may not be very clear, but in here is a, an image of some of this uh, swayvite, and it's like a concrete-like material with mixtures of, of nice, um, the sedimentary carbonate rocks and a few mafic plasts in there as well, sort of mixture. So as a biologist, if you walk along this, uh, these breccia hills, you can pick up lumps of gneiss on the right-hand side, it's a one centimeter scale bar, and you will see, um, you will see these green layers of microbes growing just beneath the surface of this impact gneiss. And these are called crypto-endolithic communities. They're primarily made of cyanobacteria and algae. They grow inside the rock, forming this layer, because on the surface of the rock, conditions are very extreme in a polar desert, so that they, they prefer not to grow on there. If they grow too deep in the rock, they don't have enough light for photosynthesis. These are photosynthetic microbes. And so as a consequence, they form these layers of microorganisms. And what was interesting about this at the time was that no one had previously reported microbial cryptoendolithic growth in this way in a crystalline nisic rock. You can see the unshocked material in the bottom left there, that's a one centimeter scale bar. And the reason for this is that generally speaking, nice is of insufficient porosity and translucence to light to allow for cryptoendolithic growth. So if you go anywhere else in the world, you pick up a lump of nice, generally not find these habitats to light. But if you take this rock and you heat it to over a thousand degrees centigrade and you pressurize it as illustrated um, here, then what you end up with is this sort of pumice-like texture on the right-hand side. And what's gone on here is the rock has been partially melted, turned into a glass. Some of the water, if it was around that rock, has been volatilized and has caused this vesicularization, probably vapor formation in the rock. And it's also been fractured by the pressure wave and the decompression of that pressure wave uh, as it, as it uh, travels through the target rock at the time of impact. And you can see an SEM image here in the, in the left here, and you can see it's got this Swiss cheese-like texture, and these pores are interconnected and allow the microbes to grow. If you look at the data in the bottom here, the pore surface area um, for pores of one micron and greater, so those sorts of pores that are suitable for microbial growth, 
is increased by 25 times, and the light transmission through the rock is increased by that order of magnitude, depending on, of course, the, the shock levels. So here is an example of how impact can improve the conditions for life by fracturing and vesicularizing rock and creating habitats for life. It's counterintuitive to our general sense of what a, an extremely large and catastrophic energy input into an ecosystem should do. I should say at the time of impact, of course, these rocks would have been sterilized. This is way above the upper temperature limit for life. So it is true that this was a bad thing for life at the time of impact. But the point is that sometime afterwards, once the temperatures have cooled down to below the upper temperature limit for life, the, the geological conditions in the crater are improved. Um, by the way, just for some side uh, diversion for a few seconds, this is rock habitat nomenclature. Um, geomicrobiologists are a sad lot. We sit around coffee rooms having arguments about what we should name microbes. A crypto endolith, crypto hidden, endo inside, lith, lithos rock, is a microbe that grows in the interstices of a rock just beneath the surface. You can't see it from the surface. Hence these um, crypto endolithic communities at the top right. If it grows in a, in a macroscopic fracture, we call it a chasmo endolith. And of course, there's a, um, a, a discussion to be had about when is a, a fracture, a, a macroscopic fracture, or a connected intergrained spectrum. I won't get into that now, but clearly there's a, there's a little bit of a, um, uh, a, a, a transition between here. A U endolith is an organism that actively burrows into a rock. An epilith is something that grows on the surface, and a hyperlith is something that grows on the subsurface. So that's what I'm talking about here. Crypto endoliths, just thought I'd mention that. They are similar to endoliths found in the Antarctic. Uh, normally, when you find these organisms, they're in rocks that are, uh, are naturally porous and permeable, such as, for example, sandstones. Here is a sedimentary rock, a sandstone. You can see these pore spaces and this lichen uh, and this um, cyanobacterium has grown within the rock. This is a half centimeter scale bar. And this is from the dry valleys of the Antarctic. And if you go to polar regions, you can find crypto endoliths inside porous sedimentary rocks. These communities are not unusual. It's just unusual to find them in a crystalline metamorphic rock um, in the impact crater. But I'm gonna come back to sandstones in a bit because I want to talk about what happens when you, um, when you hit a sandstone with, with an asteroid or comet. I should also say one of the reasons for being inside, a, um, inside an endolith is that it provides a thermal advantage as the rock heats up from solar insulation. So this is a, an impact shot rock in fact, it's a slice of this one in the top right, where I've put some thermocouples in there, simply to illustrate that during the Arctic summer, uh, the green here is the air temperature, the red is the surface of the rock, and the black is at two millimeters depth inside that endolithic habitat. So by living in a rock, because of solar insulation, you get a thermal advantage and the microbes can get improved growth conditions, which I should say do not last long. This is temperatures up in Horton Crater over a year, as you can see, the growing season is rather short uh, over sort of July uh, and August. But nevertheless, during that period, uh, that's one of the advantages of being in there. Another advantage is that it cuts out ultraviolet radiation inside the rock. The UV radiation is partly scattered by the, um, the top surface of the rock. So that's why they're, they're growing uh, inside these materials. So following on from that, Alex Pontefract, um, uh, who is working with Gordon Mazinski, some of you might know, uh, was, did some work for her PhD, where we looked in a little bit more detail at the relationship between shock level and, uh, and biology. And what you're looking at here is on the x-axis shock level. And this is just a way of um, creating a scale for different shock pressures. So zero is essentially nearly unshocked and seven, uh, the rocks have been shocked to about 80 gigapascals, so linear scale in between. What you'll see is that as you increase the shock, the number of cells, which is on the y-axis here, number of cells per gram of, of rock uh, increases as you increase the shock level. This is a demonstration that uh, that, shock, that shock is increasing the, the porosity and permeability of the rock and providing more space for the microbes to get into the rock and colonize it. What you'll notice though is that the porosity um, exponentially increases as you, as you go to these very high shock pressures and yet the increase in cell numbers is linear. And this is something that needs to be looked at. I would guess that maybe one hypothesis to explain this is although the porosity has increased, as you increase the shock pressures, you also melt the rock because those high shock pressures are associated with high temperatures. So high porosity does not necessarily imply high permeability. 
you can have pore spaces that are not connected. So as you heat the rock, you may increase the porosity, the total bulk porosity, but if they're not connected, then the microbes are not going to get the corresponding advantage of being able to move into the rock. So I suspect that these very highly shot rocks, uh, and I'll show you some evidence of that in a moment, have just melted. So although the porosity has increased so broadly, we get an increase in cell numbers, they're not able to take advantage of much of that pore space because of the um, uh, because of melting. We can also look at the diversity of life. What's interesting is as you increase the, um, the porosity, which itself, as I've just shown you, is roughly a function of, of the shock pressure, you increase the diversity of life. So this is the inverse Simpson, which is a metric measuring the diversity. Think of it as a number of species, if you like, inside the rock. So the inverse Simpson uh, metric is telling you the diversity. So as it increases, um, you have a larger number of species inside the rock. And as you shock the rock, you can also see that uh, the numbers of different taxa are increased. Uh, this is cyanobacteria, so photosynthetic organisms, as you increase the shock level. This can probably be understood by something that's been well known by ecologists, which is called the species area effect, where if you increase the surface area available for colonization, uh, you can increase the diversity. So in a very crude way, you can think of it as create more space, you can fit more stuff in it, more species in it. That's sort of very broadly how one can think of a species air effect. So if you shock these rocks and you increase the porosity, there's more space in there, there's more potential for things to get in there and colonize. So you increase the diversity of life. So this is an illustration of something that's completely opposite to um, extinguishing 75% of life on the planetary scale. For example, at the end Cretaceous extinction, showing you that after an impact, those impact fracture rocks may actually provide habitats that allow for a greater diversity of life than would have been possible before uh, the impact. And this is just an NMDS plot showing you that the species within unshocked rocks here are different from moderately shocked and high shocked rocks. Say high shocked rocks are about 80 gigapascals, moderately shocked rocks here are sort of around 30 to 50 gigapascals. So not only do we increase the diversity, but we also end up with a unique microbial community. And that probably reflects the, um, the change in the, uh, the minerality, which I will show you in a second. So increase in uh, total biomass and increase in diversity and unique microbial communities associated with the impact shock rocks. I'm not gonna dwell on this too much. These diagrams are, are not very helpful. It's not easy to see. But anyway, uh, just to get to the take home point, if you look at the shock level here, this is the percentage of different elements expressed as equivalent oxides, the typical XRF uh, data. And what you can see here is that depending on the shock level, the, uh, the concentrations of the, 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 the relative concentrations of different elements has changed. And that's probably because different minerals are, are heated, uh, melted, maybe some volatilized, uh, their positions in the rocks have changed depending upon the shock levels. This is a rather complex thing to try and understand. I think it would be something very interesting to do to get into some of the geophysics of uh, understanding the effects of impact on the, on the rock composition and the subsequent effects on biology, which we've been talking about with Sean. But anyway, um, regardless of the mechanism behind this and what's going on geologically, you can clearly see that uh, depending on the shock levels, the, the, the relative abundances of different elements change. And because microbes are of course affected by their chemical environment, this might also be one explanation for the way in which um, the, the chemical environment changes the diversity of microbes in these environments. But importantly, none of, there's no obvious loss of any bioessential element, no major cation or anion that seems to have been completely removed, at least in the case of Horton. So what's changing here is the bulk chemistry, but they, the rocks never become uninhabitable because something is completely volatilized. Uh, having said that, just as a caveat, um, at the time of impact, when these rocks were heated to over a thousand degrees, one would expect things like phosphorus and organic nitrogen to be volatilized, a little bit like a wildfire. Sometimes I like to think of heated volcanic rocks as similar to a wildfire substrate where you've got an intense temperature that volatilizes um, uh, sort of lower molecular weight elements like carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, but given we don't have a fresh impact crater to look at the immediate effect of impacts on low molecular weight compounds, we can't answer that question. We can only look at these longer, uh, these, these longer lived elements. And I should say, what we really need is a nice fresh impact crater. Perhaps we should be 
careful what you ask for. <laughs> but of course, you know, what we lack here, so, I mean, it is a serious point, what we lack here, which is untrue for many other changes in the biosphere, you can go and look at the primary succession sequence of biology after a wildfire or after a volcanic eruption or after a tsunami. But of course, we don't have any fresh crater with which to understand the primary succession sequence immediately after an impact crater, which is something that, of course, the ecologists would like to have. Uh, so we, in some sense, we look at it from a primary succession point of view. What I'm trying to do here is reconstruct how these environments might have been colonized once they cooled down. So just to connect with the astrobiology um, angle on, on all of this, these fractured rocks uh, made me wonder a long time ago whether they might have been good on early Earth. Of course, this is nice, not basalt or, or comartiites or other things that might have existed on early Earth. If you think about this as a general geophysical process of shattering rocks, you might hypothesize that on early Earth, when the impact flux was much higher, perhaps impact fracture rocks would have provided good habitats for life, improved habitats, particularly on a planet where the UV radiation flux might have been about three orders of magnitude more damaging to biology because there was no ozone shield, no oxygen in the atmosphere. We think that the UV radiation on early Earth is a lot higher than it is today. So I wondered, I sort of wrote this speculative paper in 2014 talking about impact shot rocks on early Earth and whether they might have been useful. And then we got the opportunity to fly some experiments to the International Space Station. So I took some Horton impact shot nice and I inoculated it with Crocodiopsis. And we flew it to Space Station and bolted it on the outside and left it exposed to space conditions for 22 months. Uh, it was exposed to a UV flux greater than uh, 110 nanometers. On early Earth, it actually would have cut off at 200 nanometers because of carbon dioxide. But we're right above the atmosphere. So you also get this far UV component as well. So this is a much wor even worse case scenario than the early Earth. Anyway, it can be used to explore this general idea that um, living inside a rock protects you sufficiently from ultraviolet radiation over some period of time to allow for growth. And sure enough, when you bring them back, um, this is the rock beforehand. And afterwards, it's gone brown. It's been, um, it's been caramelized, if you like, Maillard reactions. It's, it's been chemically reacted in the, in the ultraviolet radiation of space. It's essentially been well, creme brulee, if you like. It's the same chemical reaction, sort of Maillard reaction. And on the surface of the rock, the Raman signature of the carotenoids that the microbes contain has disappeared. But inside the rocks, you can see the Raman signature, and you can extract the microbes, and they grow. So this is a very simple demonstration that an impact shot rock can provide a habitat where the survival time easily exceeds the doubling time of growth conditions of microbes. So it shows you that some of these impact shot rocks might have been suitable habitats for life on early Earth. Given the caveat I said earlier, this is a Nisic substrate, not uh, which may not have existed on, probably didn't exist on early Earth, but the, the principle of a fractured rock is, is what's being tested here. So that's just an astrobiological aspect on, um, on the fractured rocks. So we might also wonder um, what happens then when we shock a rock that is already porous. So I've just shown you that if you take a crystalline rock and you shock it, it enhances access to rock by fracturing it. What would happen if we took a high porosity rock, such as those sandstones that I've just shown you had cryptolithic communities, and we shock that? And one hypothesis could be, well, some of that initial energy must go into closing port space. So you could hypothesize it would get worse for life and therefore become unsuitable for biology, almost like the opposite effect. Um, crystalline rocks become suitable cryptoanalytic habitats, suitable cryptoanalytic habitats in sandstones become unsuitable. And you can go up to the Horton and you can collect um, sandstones, which are also one of the target materials. And this is a one centimeter scale bar. What it shows you is a rock that's been shot to about 5.5, 10 gigapascals, shock level two, according to this other scheme. And I've colonized it with Crocodiopsis. And you can see that this organism has grown through these sandstone grains in much the same way that I showed you that endolith in the Antarctic. But where the impact energy, the shock wave has squashed the grains together, the organism is prevented from moving into the, um, into the sandstone. And on the bottom right hand side is just another staining image. And if you go and collect lots of rocks and look at them, you qualitatively can conceptualize what is happening in an impact. And actually, it's a little bit more complicated than the hypothesis I explained earlier. So this is shock level, which might broadly go from you know, unshocked to about 60 gigapascals and colonization potential. So it's just a qualitative diagram showing what's going on. So you take an unshocked rock and you shock it, you, you pass a pressure wave through it, the pores collapse, 
and you end up with a habitat that is less suitable for life, which I've just shown you. However, if you continue to shock that rock beyond the point at which the pores have collapsed, then you sort of move into that realm that I was discussing for the Nisic rock beforehand, where that extra energy has to go somewhere and you start to melt and fracture the rock. Some of that rock may recrystallize and form glasses, which makes it less suitable for colonization. So you can start to see this gets complicated. And then eventually, if you shock it enough, it will completely melt and turn into a solid glass, which is presumably not very good for life. And if you go into the field and you test this, uh, indeed, you can see these effects occurring. So here's an Antarctic sandstone endolith from the Antarctic. And on the right hand side is a sandstone that has been shocked to shock level five now to about 20 to 35 gigapascals. And this rock you can see is sort of glassy, but it's now got this vesicular structure. So the, the sandstone grains have been squashed together, which initially made it a bad habitat. And now it's been heated up even more and pressurized even more. It's full of these vesicles. And that has allowed for the colonization of a cyanobacterial community, just to compare that to the one I showed you earlier. And if you continue to heat it, you end up with these vesicles. This is a half centimeter scale bar. It's just a close up. Uh, it's, it's a bit fuzzy in the middle, but you can see how the microbes can grow through these vesicular structures in the rock. So these are no longer pore spaces in the original rock, but glassy vesicles. That shot level five, if you shock it even more, it's greater than 35 gigapascals. Um, so we're down here on the right hand side, bottom right. You just end up with a solid lump of glass, and the microbes can only grow as epiliths on the surface of the rock. So that's on the surface. And one of the things that interested me um, that I had an opportunity to test was what happens in the deep subsurface where much of life might reside on the planet. We don't know how much um, <clears throat> of Earth's microbiology is underground. It's something between 10 and 50%, depending on whose papers you read. These are data from ocean drilling projects just showing you numbers of microbes um, as, as a log function per centimeter cube as, and depth down here. And these are a collection of data. You can see there's a logarithmic decline in microbial biomass as you go into the subsurface. This is the South Pacific gyre uh, into the crust just beneath that region of the ocean, which is one of the most nutrient poor regions of the Earth. So you can see there's variation, but generally a logarithmic decline. And you could ask yourself, what is the effect of impact on, um, on these uh, materials? So, um, a few years ago, we got the opportunity to collect a core from the Chicxulub impact crater, crater associated with that other aspect of impact biology, mass extinctions. And we were able to drill into the peak ring, as you can see here, this is a gravity map of the crater, and this is the drilling rig. And this was mainly a geophysical uh, expedition, but with some microbiology uh, in there as well. And you can read about the, the results of all these other things, you know, people here who are been publishing on some of the other aspects of, of biology, Chris. But let me just focus on this story today, which is the effects of the, on the rock. And to, to try and summarize this in the interest of time, this is the core on the right-hand side. The pink part is the basement granite, which is sort of rebounding, because it's rebounding during the asteroid impact. And it's got these intercalated uh, lithologies. Some of these impact melts, some of them are pre-impact material. Then you've got this sway bike, which is what I was talking about in Horton, you can see here, this is a tsunami research deposit that would have flown, flowed back into the crater immediately after impact in giant tsunami waves, probably on the orders of tens of, of minutes. So this is a catastrophic event. And then everything that's been laid down um, over the last 66 million years, post-impact sequences. And from the point of view of this talk, all I want to do is point out that in the deep subsurface, we've got this region here where we've got increased porosity in the swayvite which is associated with an increase in the cell numbers and the DNA in the core. So here is another example of the way in which impact fracturing, the formation of small fracture spaces mm -hmm. through rocks, has improved, um, has improved the conditions for life. And another reason in the deep subsurface why this might be better for life is because these fractures will also enhance energy and nutrient flow, fluid flow through the deep subsurface. And microbes need continuous fluid flow to grow. So the fracture spaces may provide um, conduits for uh, energy and nutrients to flow through the deep subsurface and improve the conditions um, for, for life. We can look at the microbial communities in here. This is probably the most useless diagram in the whole talk. But for the microbiologists amongst you, this will show you the taxa uh, at a family and phylum level in the three different um, 
lithology, so porcelain, perhaps wave like granite basement. And what you're looking at here is just a Venn diagram. You can figure these numbers as a species within each lithology. And the simple point is that although there is some overlap, there are distinctive communities within the different impact lithologies. And on the face of it, this scientifically isn't very surprising because microbes are affected by geochemistry. If you've got different rock types, you would expect different microbes. But I still find it um, sort of amazing that 66 million years after this impact, the deep biosphere is still shaped by the geological rearrangements caused by that catastrophe. And what this shows you is that um, impacts influence the conditions for microbiology over uh, million year timescales and, and potentially giga year timescales. There are impact craters on the earth that are more than a billion years old and that geology has been altered by impact. So understanding the effects of impact on, on geology and the effects of life is not just some attempt to understand some transient effect of an energy input into the crust of the earth. It's actually about understanding the, the crust of a planet over planetary lifetimes. We could ask ourselves, what are the influences? What are the things that influence the microbial communities in the impact rocks? Um, and they're shown up here. So this is this principal component plot, trying to understand which of the environmental parameters that were measured in the expedition can explain the microbial diversity. And I've underlined porosity here, uh, just to emphasize that this is a process that in some sense is independent of the chemistry of the target sites, a geophysical effect on rocks. So anywhere where there's an impact, we would expect porosity to change and therefore for it to have some influence on the microbial community. And of course, other things like temperature, iron, manganese, sulfur, or whatever else happens to be chemically mixed into the target rocks will clearly influence what happens to the communities afterwards. So there will be impact specific effects. But porosity is a general geophysical effect on all um, rock types. I'm not gonna go through this in detail, this one, but just to show you, we showed a similar thing in the Chesapeake Bay impact crater that we had an opportunity to drill 10 years before. Uh, this is a 35, uh, 33 million year old impact structure off the coast of uh, Chesapeake, unsurprisingly. This is another core. And down here at the bottom, you will see um, impact breccia, similar, you know, at least geophysically similar to the sort of material I was just talking to you about, tsunami research deposits in the, che in the Chesapeake structure, and then heavily fractured schist and pegmatite. And in here, we also found increases in microbial numbers, and in this particular crater, increases in the concentration of Fe2 plus, reduced iron. And reduced iron is produced by iron reducing bacteria. Down there, we found DNA associated with Geobacter. This is a, uh, a taxa of um, iron reducing bacteria that do microbial iron, iron reduction. So that Fe2 plus probably reflects um, biological iron, iron reduction. Here is another example of uh, an impact induced habitat for life. So you can begin to see some of these effects in the deep subsurface uh, as well. Let me um, just talk a little bit about some of the astrobiological consequences of this that we'll get increasingly speculative in the next 10 minutes. And to think about what, what this might mean in terms of just widening the thinking to habitability in general. So what I've looked at, of course, here and described to you as some empirical evidence from craters on the earth, what might it tell us about uh, habitability on other planets that might have different impact uh, fluxes. So one place people are interested in looking for life, at least testing the hypothesis of whether it ever had life, is Mars. And Mars is a very interesting place um, from a, an impact biology point of view, because of course it's covered in impact craters. Um, this is a database published uh, about a decade ago. I think there's actually a more recent paper. But anyway, these databases now have about 350,000 craters. Every single one of these dots is an impact crater on Mars, different sizes. On the Earth, there are probably about 200 well-defined impact craters, and that increases every year by a few people constantly reporting new ones. The reason why, of course, there's a lot more on Mars is it's got nothing to do with the impact flux, uh, which in the inner solar system broadly been quite similar. Uh, the reason is that Mars has not had plate tectonics. So many of the old impact craters going back to three and a half billion years even before that uh, are, are still preserved on the surface of Mars. And in addition, Mars does not have or has not had in the last sort of three billion years, a vigorous hydrological regime, an aeolian erosional regime. So craters are quite well preserved. On the earth, they've either been subducted or they've been eroded away. So it's, it's quite difficult to find uh, uneroded uh, craters. I should also say on earth, um, biology messes up craters. Go to places like Swang Impact Crater in South Africa, it's covered in vegetation, which helps 
uh, which erodes the craters. So anyway, you might think, well, the, the interesting thing about Mars is that the, the, the subsurface you would predict would be pervasively fractured by impact craters and might therefore have some sort of influence on, on the conditions for life, habitability of life. And you can do some simple calculations. These are some calculations we did with Gareth Collins at Imperial recently, where we did some very crude calculations where you can simply take the expected pressure wave from an impact crater using modeling. You can work out the volume of fractured rock that you might expect under that crater, making certain assumptions on uh, basaltic behavior of basaltic rocks under uh, impact pressure. And then you can add up all those craters and bin them, and you can work out the total surface area in the subsurface of Mars caused by impact fracturing. And it's about 3 million to 200 million times the surface area of a Mars radius sphere. So if you think about Mars as a completely flat billiard ball, it, it's that number of surface areas. And I appreciate that's a bit of an odd non-SI unit, but it's sort of easier to conceptualize than kilometers squared. So if you think of you know, 30 million Mars equivalent surfaces, all in fractures in the subsurface, you can sort of uh, see, uh, think more clearly about how vast that fracture space is. So does that mean that the Martian subsurface is um, habitable, or had improved conditions for life? Is there life there? Uh, of course, I don't know the answer to any of these questions, uh, and nor do any of us. But, uh, but what I think it might do is thinking about impact habitability in this way. Um, it might encourage us to test that hypothesis by drilling into the subsurface of Mars and say retrieving a core, which I understand, of course, is a technically difficult thing to do. But as a, as a biologist, what I would like to do, would like to see is a core from the subsurface. And we can look in those fracture spaces and we can see whether there's been enhanced fluid flow, whether it's improved conditions for habitability. And of course, if there was life, uh, whether there was any um, life to take advantage of those uh, fractures. So that's just an application of um, an understanding of, of biology to thinking about um, how that might have influenced conditions on Mars. And of course, the significance of this is that uh, here's a planet where impact fracturing is a lot more relevant to habitability than, than the Earth, where in, uh, looking at the biology of craters is rather an, an ephemeral thing. Finally, let's just talk um, in the last part of this about the origin of life. This is really speculative, and actually origin of life is not my area of research. But what I thought I would do is just in the last part of this, make some comments about impact craters to get you thinking about, could they be interesting in the origin of life? And this is just a paper I published a long while ago, uh, having a think about this. There are plenty of other papers by uh, people like David Kring and others, um, Gordon Zinsky and, and other people who thought about the origin of life. But in this paper, I just summarized a sort of shopping list of interesting attributes of craters that one might want to consider from an origin of life point of view. Well, the first thing that happens, which I haven't talked about in this, uh, in this talk so far, is that when the thermal pulse is delivered into the surface of a, of a planet, that thermal pulse will heat up the water and generate a hydrothermal system, which will circulate around the crater for some length of time, depending upon the scale of the impactor and the way in which the energy is delivered. This is a paper by Gordon Zinsky for the Horton crater, just to connect it back to the earlier part of the uh, lecture. And what you can see here is the time uh, after impact. It's about 10,000 years. This is the temperature of the hydrothermal system. So it cools down as the, uh, as the heat is dissipated. And then in the crater, you've got various types of minerals associated with this hydrothermal activity. And you can actually use these minerals to, to um, constrain the temperature. Of a hydrothermal system that as a biologist I always thought was quite ingenious but I understand it's quite a common thing to do um, and what's interesting about this from an origin of life point of view is that the formation of organic molecules is of course dependent upon temperatures you can form this is from another paper just showing you temperature and the formation of different carboxylic acids at different temperatures so what I always thought was intriguing about impact hydrothermal systems is you've got this really well-defined temperature uh, gradient, where you might expect certain molecules to form at different temperatures. And as you cool down, you come into the, the temperature range of life where it's no longer too high temperature for biology. So you could sort of imagine as you cool down, you complexify organic compounds, or at least provide an environment that is more suitable for complex organics. In contrast to everyone's pet uh, origin of life sites, which are hydrothermal vents in the deep ocean, where you have a temperature gradient, but not temporally, it's a spatial gradient, from the inside of a hydrothermal vent to the outside. And in impact craters, you've got this nice temporal gradient as you cool down. I'm not sure what 
effects that would have. The, the chemists will know more than I do, but I thought that was interesting, um, something to think about. Secondly, just linking it in with what I've been talking about, of course, you've got vast fracture volumes and surfaces, and those fractures might produce prebiotic molecules of interest, such as hydrogen for serpentinization, but they could also just be surfaces for uh, templates, prebiotic synthesis, circulation of fluids for prebiotic reactants and so on uh, and so forth. Uh, then you've got the concentration of reactants. So in the ocean, where you have a hydrothermal vent, if you produce an interesting prebiotic molecule, it will tend to, unless it gets trapped in a pore space, be diluted by the ocean. But in an impact crater, you might have a melt sheet that confines the hydrothermal system to beneath the crater. And you've got a concentration, uh, a bulk, a large scale concentration of fluid beneath the crater, where these molecules can go round and round, taking part in chemical synthesis without necessarily being diluted. And this is um, just a, a diagram by Normov, who looked at the hydrothermal uh, minerals through this uh, crater in Russia. And this uh, is a 196 million year old crater, so rather old. But anyway, from the point of view of this part of the talk, just to show you, you get these large numbers of hydrothermal minerals and clays and zeolites, which are useful for the surfaces, for chemical reactions, forming deep in the crater and formed over long periods of time as this hydrothermal system continues to circulate. And some of these zeolites that have been found in craters are interesting because you can look them up in the literature and you'll find not only do they appear in papers to do with, the, with, with craters, but they also pop up in papers where people have used um, uh, templates to make prebiotic reactions. So origins of life, people get very excited by these because they provide ionic surfaces on which you can trap organic molecules and then they come together and bind and form more complex things or are transformed. So zeolites in clays are, are things that people have uh, hypothesized could be reactant surfaces for reactants to come together in the origin of life. And yet these things are also formed um, at great abundance in hydrothermal um, impact craters, impact systems. And then the other thing that's interesting about impacts is that they are diverse experiments in the origin of life. And what I mean by that is that um, hydrothermal systems are, are diverse. So you can find alkaline hydrothermal systems or black smokers. There's certainly diversity with volcanic hydrothermal systems, but they tend to be localized to tectonic margins. And, and so therefore there is a rather narrow range of, of um, sort of geological characteristics, if you like, chemical characteristics. Whereas impacts, of course, are completely indiscriminate and they will occur anywhere on the early earth. So they might have occurred in Camartiites or basaltic islands or whatever other people, whatever people speculate the land masses of the early earth would be like. But nevertheless, what you've got here is um, differently sized pulses of energy with different lengths of hydrothermal systems in all different mineralogies on the early earth in different geographical locations potentially different environments. In other words, all of the parameter space of possible thermal regimes and mineralogical regimes are tested by the impact process, which I think makes it rather interesting to think about what sort of things might you be experimenting with in terms of the origin of life on early up. It seems to be much broader than, um, than hydrothermal systems. So in summary, just to finish off this little bit of a speculation, I think that these systems are very interesting. This is just to summarize. Uh, what's going on here. I uh, put up here, you can almost think of them as a literal uh, Darwin's warm little pond where you've got a hydrothermal system trapped in a crater, all these different things going on. Now I should point out, I'm not much in favor of this sort of polarization in the origins of life. So I'm not saying forget hydrothermal systems and origins on the beach, impact craters, rah, rah, rah. Okay, so I'm not, I don't think necessarily the origin of life has to have occurred in any one environment. I mean, for all I know, maybe it happened in in a variety of different environments. But I do think this is something that hasn't been explored a great deal. As I say, there have been thoughts from people like David Kring and others, this isn't a new idea, but there's been very little experimental testing. For example, taking zeolites from craters and doing origins of life experiments or looking at um, you know, well-defined thermal regimes and the presence of hydrothermal minerals. There's probably lots of work you could do in this area, connecting origins of life with geophysics and geology of impact rates. So if anyone out there are looking for projects or, or sort of directions to go, and I think this would be probably something interesting for um, people to do. I'm interested to what happens. So finally, let me uh, just conclude. Um, 
I'm going to conclude by simply saying that I think we need to think of impacts as a biological process, not merely a geological one. By the way, the title to my talk, Impact Cratering as a Biological Process, I stole that from Jay Maloche, a modification. You may be aware that in the late 1980s, he published a book called Impact Cratering as a Geological Process. And it's rather a sort of seminal book. Some of it's now quite old, but it still uh, retains a sort of lucidity and, 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 and conciseness that makes it uh, an outstanding book, although it's quite difficult to get hold of. And so I simply swapped out geological with biological. And what I want to suggest is that uh, in addition to the obvious importance of geological processes, there are a whole variety of uh, influences and impacts as a biological process. I've talked about the geophysical effects on rock. We could talk about mass extinctions. We could also talk about more speculative ideas of impacts, launching rocks containing microbes into space that are transferred to other planets that some people think about. Um, and there are other there are other angles on this as well. Uh, we do tend to have a skewed view of impacts as agents of destruction, as I've shown you here. Uh, they can uh, alter rocks in different ways, uh, driven by geophysical changes. And some of those alterations are not simple, as I showed you the sandstone. Just to make the point I made right at the beginning of my talk, it's a universal process. Uh, and so from the point of view of early Earth, astrobiology, some of these wider questions of habitability, I think this is an important process to consider because it is one of the, um, the, the, the perturbations that can occur to biospheres anywhere in the universe, and particularly given the uh, universal effects of fracturing, porosity changes, and so forth. So you can sort of get ideas about how that might affect other planets. And I'm giving you one example in the case of, of Mars. So as I said, many potentially interesting astrobiological consequences that are largely unknown, particularly this origin of life question. So I'll end there. Um, I hope that's uh, created some connections between biology and geophysics. It would be great to continue some collaborations, talking to Sean. Hopefully we'll get some projects going here between us and Edinburgh. Uh, so in the meantime, thank you very much for coming along today and for your attention. Cheers. Thank you, Connie, again. Can we start here? Thank you. It's, I guess, pretty clear that the, the impact and the shock will change the porosity. Yeah. And as you showed, the numerous examples where there's a link between the availability of pore space and the number and the diversity of, of the microbes. But that link, as you acknowledged in the beginning, isn't one-to-one. -one. It seemed like there was one place where there's a linear relationship while porosity is exponential. But I also guess on one of the slides, it looked the other way around, that there was more variations in the number of microbes than there was in the pore space. And so given that in mind, could you recap why we think that the availability of pore space is the limiting or the controlling factor for the evolution of these communities? So is it, have they just been sitting around waiting for more porosity to increase in complexity? Or are there other settings where, you know, it's maybe just some sort of pinching, right? Whatever it is, factor X, smaller, larger, and then we have changes. Is it really the porosity that's this big deal? Yeah, that's a, I mean, it's a really excellent point. So, so first of all, in some communities, it's not the surface area per se that's limiting the organs. Although if you have more surface area, you can, you can fit in more diversity. But I don't think that's necessarily the control on the biomass. I think the effect on the por of the porosity is the, is the flow of uh, water and thereby nutrients and energy through the rock. So the higher porosity, the easier it is to create a continuous flow of nutrients. Otherwise, the environment becomes run down and the microbes in there are simply dependent upon nutrients that might be uh, released by organisms that are dying out in that environment. So it sort of becomes a self-perpetuating community within the pore space. If you have um, pores connected and the rock is permeable, you can get new redox couples to flow in, uh, new sources of nitrogen and phosphorus. So I think that's probably the control on the um, on the diversity in the biomass in the rocks, not so much the, act, the surface area as such, you know, the living space. And in fact, in many subsurface environments, I think there's good evidence that in fact it, it isn't necessarily the, the um, surface area. You can have you can have large porosity, but with very low hydrological conductivity. There's not much water flowing through, and and low biomass. So simply having porosity will not get you low biomass if there if if there isn't fluid flow through those uh, pore spaces. And then, of course, as I pointed out, there's, there's the 
uh, complication of porosity versus permeability, which of course are two very different things from the point of view of the biology. The pore spaces need to be connected for those for those redox couples and nutrients to flow through. So that's a very general response. More specifically, I think there's probably a lot one could do to look at that in more detail. We often thought about how we can make, you know, no, I mean, not only just in the impact um, context, but generally how one could make a really nice series of of um, reproducible rocks with given porosities and permeabilities to explore some of these issues by putting them out in the environment or artificially colonizing them in the lab. So if anyone you know, has got bright ideas on how one can create uh, materials with um, with defined porosities and permeabilities that also contain elements that you want to put in there. So I don't just want some piece of nutrient core silica put but a rock that contains elements. I think that would be a good way of trying to look at these processes. Otherwise, you're left with the complexity of natural rocks, which, as you can see in this talk, you can pull out general patterns. Once you start drilling into the detail, it's difficult to disentangle uh, the various factors that might actually be influencing microbial communities. Thanks. If I could just ask a quick question before passing this on. So why did you have to fly this rock to the space station rather than putting it in a tanning salon or something like that? Oh, yeah, that's that's also a good question. The, the, the reason is that um, you can simulate UV on the Earth. Of course, you can just buy a, a UVC bulb. But the thing about space is you've got the, the complexity of the whole spectral wavelength. It's difficult to, um, to, uh, to replicate in a lab exactly. Okay. But then you don't know which one did it, right? Was it whatever the, I don't know, charged particles? No, but at least you've got the, the measurements of the full spectrum. And it's the natural stellar spectrum where you simply remove, you, you added in that radiation, that otherwise it'd be cut out by the atmosphere. You know, so if, it, if you would put it on a UV, it wouldn't do that. Like if you had like an artificially restricted spectrum, it would not show the same reaction. No, it probably would. I think if you put this under, any, I mean, you could put it under a monochromatic 254 nanometer UV source and probably do exactly the same thing. But the reason for sending it into space is because you've got the natural stellar spectrum and you've got those short wavelengths that, that are the, um, the, 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 the multiple wavelengths associated with that short wavelength region. And you could probably make a bulb that roughly um, replicated that UVC region. In fact, you can do, but you can't do any better than simply do the experiment. We fly it above the Earth's atmosphere, get rid of the ozone shield, and expose it to the um, the real spectrum from the sun. Okay, so I think it's just a question of the opportunity is there. You've got a rocket that will send it to space station. You know, we can try and simulate it. Why not just do the experiment? So that was really the reason why we did it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um. Yeah. Great talk. Um. Following up on a point you kind of ended up on, how well do we understand the survival communities in the protolith? I mean, both for ejective but also recolonization. You mean after impact? Uh, yeah, uh, during the impact process and yeah. through the impact. So during the impact, obviously close to ground zero, the, the, the rocks are simply sterilized. They're not only sterilized at high enough temperatures that carbon compounds from microbes will just be volatilized. So this is going to end up as an extremely sterile environment. But immediately afterwards, a hydrothermal system will set in. And that hydrothermal system will start to cool down. You'll end up with patches in the crater that will remain sterile for some period of time. Other patches where you'll have temperatures below the upper temperature limit for life, 122, but still hot. So you end up with thermophiles, hyperthermophiles, so heat loving organisms that will remain in those patches for long enough um, and, until it begins to cool down to sort of mesophilic temperatures. So the evidence for some of that linked to biology is there are, in, I didn't discuss it in this talk, but there are two or three papers from Horton, a Rochefort crater, Chicxulub, showing um, sulfur isotope fractionations associated with sulfate reduction, associated with minerals that are at these high temperatures of 70, 80 degrees or thereabouts, slightly higher. And this has been published as evidence for microbial sulfate reduction in the post-impact hydrothermal system. So there's some rock record fossil evidence of colonization of post-impact hydrothermal systems. And then eventually, as it cools down, life will move in to the crater and recolonize that environment. And it depends, of course, the, the local environment. If it's a land-based um, crater, uh, like Horton probably was, then the colonization sequence would presumably have been into those shocked rocks, um, crypto in the list, whatever else moved into the rocks. If it's a marine environment, um, your expert is right here and can tell you about rapid colonization 
of the Chicxulub crater and the fact that within 50,000 years, the benthic and um, um, community started to reassemble over the crater. And in that situation, you can imagine where you've got large volumes of water flowing into the crater, then you've got some buffer against a hydrothermal system. And in the Chicxulub crater, you may have had an impact melt sheet, which would have sort of sealed off the really hot rocks beneath the resurge water coming in. So presumably that uh, allows things to recolonize. And maybe some of that warmth is beneficial. You also got warm water above a melt sheet, which might actually, again, be a, a potentially a, a, an example of an opportunity for life. So of course, the, the recolonization sequence will depend upon where the crater is, uh, the large scale environment, but there, are, there is some um, preliminary evidence for rapid recolonization of the hydrothermal system once it cools down to blow the upper tension limit of life. Hi, great talk. Thank you. Um, I was wondering the assumption about um, the target rock that you hit, whether it be sandstone or, or uh, basaltic kind of composition. The assumption I would think would be on Mars that you would have like a mafic or basaltic composition, but it would be a mega regolith. Um, and so what kind of order of mag reduction would you think if you had, I'm assuming that it's not a compositional control factor, it's like poor space that was already present. Uh -huh, yeah. Like how would that affect your available biome? Like I'm sure it's going to reduce it, but like, would you think it'd be order of mag, two orders of mag, something like that? Yeah, uh, I don't know. We I have, an ex I have a PhD project with Gordon Zinsky where we've been getting um, from a group in Germany, some basaltic samples that have been shot, try and look at basalt and try and understand what happens with that shot. And also, what happens to the salt that's already sort of vesiculated, the porous salt? But there's not much known. Um, the Lonar crater in India is a one kilometer diameter in impact crater. It's one of the few craters in basaltic material. Um, and, and of course, that's, that's an exciting crater with respect to early Earth and, and Mars, but for gaining some knowledge of the impact effect on basalt. It's heavily eroded, it's heavily vegetated. Uh, and in fact, uh, just a couple of days ago, we were talking to Sean that we, that someone is thinking about doing a deep drill into Lonar Crater. And I think there's one in Brazil that's in uh, basaltic substrate as well. But, but to be honest, um, impact effects into Mars relevant basalts, earlier basalts, there's not much data either from the laboratory or from uh, real impact craters on the Earth. And that's something that would be really useful to have. So what are the effects on microbes, on, on the microbiology or the biology of um, you know, basalt that's very low porosity or, or pumice-like vesicular basalt that's already got porosity? I don't know. I'd expect it to follow the sort of patterns you see that I showed you. If it's, if it's a bulk material, it would fracture. If it's vesiculated, presumably some of the impact energy will go into squashing it and maybe melting it into a glass, and then you'll end up with um, uh, volcanic glass with actually fractures in it, but it's definitely been interesting to look at. Thank you. We, we can talk more definitely at lunch. I appreciate the talk. Uh, thank you for your interesting talk. Uh, so uh, do you think the poor size plays uh, maybe a critical role in the microbial survival and activity? Uh, because uh, we are doing some lab, lab experiments and then we mix the microbes with some natural muddy sediments. And then we compress it, and we find that the, there's two order of magnitude decrease in cell numbers yeah. when we compress it only to 50 meters below sea floor. Uh -huh. Okay, that I'd be interested to talk to you about that because uh, whether you have any thoughts about why that. I mean, do you have any thoughts about why that is? Is it the flow of nutrients that's being limited? Uh, we have enough nutrients. They are all the microbes are well fed. But we still observe this, uh, yeah, significant drop in micro number. Yeah. So is that? I, I wonder though whether even though they've got enough nutrients, is there flow? Because if you end up in a pore space that's heavily compressed, you might have enough nutrients, but if it's just sitting there where the water in that pore space is saturated and there's no turnover. The microbes use that up, and then there's no other nutrients left. Or at least the nutrients are now incorporated into biomass. Anything that wants to grow has to depend upon something else dying and releasing the nutrients. So although the nutrients may be there, they're rather limited if they're just sitting static in a pore space. Whereas if you've got some permeability, um, even with the same concentration of nutrients, at least you've got flow, so you've got a continuous supply. So I don't know whether that would, whether these factors are some explanation as to what's happening when you're compressing it. 
Yeah, maybe one reason. And we're thinking if if the pools they get too small, so oh, yeah, sure. this this cells will be killed. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, that's presumably the case if you compress it so much that you uh, essentially make the pores smaller than a micron and kill the cells. But presumably that's quite easy to test. Have a look and see whether the cells still have membrane integrity under the microscope. Thank you. Interesting. Right? Yeah. Sean, can you um, unmute and ask? Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Charles, thanks uh, again for another wonderful talk this week and for all the discussions and, and meals and everything that's happened this week. It's been really great. Um, I just my a question I had that I've been thinking about since we've talked. Uh, why do we still have thermophilic and hyperthermophilic organisms, say, living in the Suebite at Chicxulub or, or, or Chesapeake when the temperatures have gotten below those temperature ranges? Why haven't they been outcompeted over, you know, the next 60 million years or so? Just curious. Yeah, yeah thanks, Sean. And by the way, thank you for the last week as well. You're fantastic. And uh, we'll be in contact anyway about various, various ideas. It's been really productive. Absolutely. Um, so that the thermophiles are probably in Chicxulub simply because of the geothermal gradient. So the temperature down in the granite is, um, I think it was about 55, 60, if I remember correctly. So thermophilic microbes are, these are definitional things, of course, not, not any fundamental science, but generally think of thermophiles as organisms with an optimum growth temperature greater than 45 degrees. So where you're, where you're deep in the crater, where the geothermal gradient produces a temperature above that, then you will have what people would call thermophiles growing there. And they're nothing to do, well, so be careful what I say. The, the moment they're nothing to do with a hydrothermal system, whether they are um, uh, descendants of things that took advantage of the hydrothermal system is another question altogether, may, may be. But they'll be there today, um, unlinked, a long time after the, um, the impact hydrothermal system has cooled down, simply because it's uh, of the background geothermal gradient. I don't know that, does that answer what you were asking? No, no, it does. It does. And then the rest of it's a porosity permeability effect, which makes a lot of sense. Right. Yeah. Any more questions? Thanks.